Um, would all of our speakers mind turning their cameras on, please? Great, thank you. Um, so hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. My name is Sandy Singh and I'm the Vice President of the Foundry. And in my day job, I lead algorithmic fairness and transparency work, among other things, at New America's Open Technology Institute. For those of you who are intimately familiar with the Foundry, we are a professional development organization composed of early career professionals who work across law, technology, and policy. And we aim to foster a community of diverse voices through writing, network building, constructive debate, and more. Today's event is the first in a series of events that we are hosting that focuses on issues of diversity, inclusion, and equity in the internet law and policy space. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our great speakers. First, we have Hodana Mar, who is an analyst at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation Center for Data Innovation, where she focuses on AI policy. Next, we have Morgan Williams, who is a general counsel for the National Fair Housing Alliance, where he leads the organization's strategic and tactical legal initiatives and affairs. And last but not least, we have Dr. Nicole Turner-Lee, who is a senior fellow in governance studies and the director of the Center for Technology Innovation at Brookings, where she researches public policy designed to enable equitable access to technology in communities around the world. So I wanted to first kick things off um, and first wanted to turn it over to Nicole. So Nicole, you've written about how educational institutions and schools are increasingly adopting AI-based tools and have talked about how this can transfer the biases of these tools to already flawed school systems. And just recently, we saw how educational programs such as the International Baccalaureate and the A-levels decided to use algorithms to predict the grades of students who couldn't sit for exams due to the pandemic and that resulted in uh, disastrous and discriminatory outcomes. So could you walk us through some of the risks that are associated with using AI in an education context? And I think you are on mute, sorry. You would think after 175 of these that I actually know to turn off the unmute button, but I didn't. <laughs> um, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to talk about this for a couple of reasons. One, um, this is my first interaction with this professional group. So hello, um, Dr. Nicole Turner-Lee at the Brookings Institution where I run the Center for Technology Innovation. So I wanna jump in because I assume that this crowd is familiar with algorithms, but if you are not, let me give you just an overview of how we define it at Brookings. I mean, obviously, machine learning is redefining how we live, learn, and earn. It's something that, you know, fuels, uh, the fuel is the currency that we provide to the internet. But as we provide more data, and COVID-19 is one of those cases where more and more data has been fed into the internet based on what we watch, what we eat, what we've ordered online, et cetera, you know, that has the potential to be biased if the machine learning algorithm uh, is developed in a way where there is some level of explicit or implicit biases of the developer, or it's adapted in ways to an environment where it picks up all the other junk. I call it a snake. It's like a snake at the end of the ocean where it becomes more opaque the deeper that you go and there's a possibility that it's picking up, you know, uh, composites around your profile, things that you bought, things that you spent on, making correlations and therefore creating some type of bias. At Brookings, we've written extensively on this. If you're interested, we have a work stream which is around AI bias papers that uh, come from a variety of scholars across the country. But in addition to that, we've defined bias, and I'm a sociologist, I'm not a scientist, as uh, the condition in which similarly situated people, things, and objects receive what's either differential treatment so the machine learning algorithm picks up on something that we may all think is blue, maybe is more gray because the algorithm has attached it to other uh, parts of, you know, context or it's been displayed in a context that's not the lab or disparate impact. And disparate impact is where people who are similarly situated to other people, for example, receive uh, rejections and lending decisions or do not see housing ads or are unable to get an IB diploma because the algorithm has not taken into account these other variables. So when this IB thing came up, in all honesty, Fondi, I was actually affected because my son was one of the COVID-19 graduates who was an IB candidate. Um, and what we found in that algorithm, to your point, is whereas the academy thought that they could actually leverage machine learning to make determinations on who should get a diploma and who should not, it turned out to be flawed because in the context of the real world, there are other variables that you have to consider. So for example, 
there is an IB standard across the United States. It could be in public schools. It could be associated with, you know, special charter schools. But for the most part, we know in the United States that education ain't equal. And yes, I said ain't as a PhD because we know that that's a historical trend that we have had challenges when it comes to the disparities that exist among the educational uh, uh, resources that are invested in schools, as well as the interpretation of achievement based on where you live, who your teacher is, et cetera. Uh, so given that, what we found in this IB diploma model is that in their effort to sort of normalize standards across the world, in fact, that they did not take into a consideration, particularly in the United States, that there would be IB programs that were poorly resourced compared to others, that there would be, and this, and the way I understand the model is they sort of took the normative of your school's achievement. So the number of kids within your school that previously received an IB diploma after uh, completing all the core requirements of the testing, in addition to the likelihood <laughs> that your school would actually have a high rate of IB diploma graduates. That does not work if you are a black or brown skin and you live in a neighborhood where you may have an IB program, but your public school is struggling to keep up with the standards. There was one article that I read that broke my heart. I mean, I live in Fairfax County, and so it still wasn't fair because there was a lot of people within our public school that didn't compare to other public schools across the, the country. But in the case of this diploma, for example, there was an article I read about a young, young woman in New Mexico who came from a school that was just you know, very, very behind when it came to resources for their IB program that, you know, had an, a small number of people who actually graduated with a diploma after they took the test. And as a result, she didn't get it <laughs> because her school was sort of classified based on pre-existing stereotypes um, of, and this misnomer that all educational IB programs were fair. So I share that, and I'm glad you asked that question because again, this is very sensitive to me. My son landed up uh, getting a diploma but I'm gonna tell you, I was very critical of this algorithm because I know there were kids who did not. When we start to look at the imposition of these models on these types of scenarios, and I'm sure Morgan is gonna talk more about it as well when it comes to housing, that are very sensitive. Housing, employment, education, financial services. If we do not account for these biases, these historical biases in these models, more than likely we are going to generate the same type of stereotypes and implicit and explicit biases that we see in the world. And the reason that I work in this space is that people of color and vulnerable populations in particular have already litigated many of these circumstances for fairness in education, housing, employment, and financial services. And so when you look at what happened with IB, there were kids who lost scholarships. There were kids who were denied or rejected based on their IB scoring. There were kids who could not get into special programs. And there were minority kids most often that would deny that probability because the science was seen to be discreet and objective. And so I would just end it here and say, as a sociologist, there are sociological implications to any scientific model, period. And I think we need to take that into account when we're looking at algorithmic bias, because whether or not I receive differential treatment as a person who, let's say, loves to buy black boots, and I tend to get black boots in short, tall, stiletto, fat heel, that doesn't make a difference. But when those black boots are tied in some way to my ability to have credit, my ability to be a productive citizen in this world because it is assumed that my height of my heel says something about my character, then I then receive disparate treatment, which at the end of the day is the denial of opportunities that the machine learning algorithm should not push me away from, which is again why I'm so passionate about this and why I'm glad you're having this conversation because we often don't understand not just what the policy implications are, but how people are ultimately affected by algorithms, which as my uh, previous mentee used to say, Al uh, Sophia Noble, algorithms that eventually oppress. So I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you, that was really great. And I 100% really, I was also an IB graduate. So when I read about this, I was like, oh my God, imagine going through the entire program to just be told no diploma for you based on some- Into a model, a model. It's so controversial. <laughs> but I remember my son saying, please mommy, don't do any interviews because I'm still being, you know, considered. <laughs> I don't want to be rejected, but I get them anyway. Because I think again, that goes back to this idea that education is equal and we know it's not. And particularly under COVID, it's gotten worse in terms of the equal opportunities that kids have in virtual settings. 
Definitely, definitely. Thank you. Um, so next, I wanted to turn it over to Morgan. So in Morgan, uh, in March 2018, uh, NFHA and three of its member organizations filed a lawsuit against Facebook, alleging that the company's algorithmic dri algorithmically driven ad platform enables landlords and real estate brokers to exclude people of color, women, people with disabilities, and other protected groups from receiving housing ads. Could you talk about the scope of the lawsuit and what some of the primary concerns were? Yes, absolutely. This is a, a um, we uh, initially uh, learned of this issue actually back in the fall of 2016, um, a fateful fall, uh, when ProPublica ran a uh, story on Facebook's ad platform. And of course, you think of social media you think of the utility of sort of connecting with folks, but obviously these platforms are uh, exist in order to serve as you know ad uh, platform space. And the way that um, advertisers engage the platform um, is that they are able to utilize these algorithmic-based systems to target their ads in different different kinds of ways. Um, these algorithms are constantly tagging users with thousands and thousands of labels and the algorithms themselves are constantly developing these labels. And these labels were then available to uh, and are to advertisers in targeting their, their ad campaigns. Um, in the housing, employment, and credit access space where there are civil rights protections against, tag against targeting, for example, housing ads um, on the basis of race or excluding people with disabilities or otherwise, um, these platforms allowed for very customized exclusions um, that notably didn't um, have a kind of Caucasian exclusion on their platform um, um, in, in the ethnic affinity section um, of the exclusion capabilities. Um, and uh, and in the course of conducting the investigation, we identified other features that were problematic, including an algorithmic-based system that was called the lookalike feature, where you could provide Facebook with a list of your you know, current clients or other other individuals in some 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 group, and they would target folks that had a similar profile, and in um, in many instances, uh, fell along demographic uh, those kinds of practices fall along demographic lines and perpetuate the kind of uh, segregative uh, steering and other practices that we've seen in the housing market over the course of the history of this country, um, but with modern technology. And so we filed this lawsuit. To challenge these practices under the Federal Fair Housing Act, um, in in partnership with some of our, our local fair housing center partners, and uh, we ultimately settled the case in March of 2019. Facebook uh, agreed in in partnership with uh, some other litigation that was being pursued in the employment context by folks at the ACLU employment um, program and 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 others. Um, for, um, uh, secured a joint resolution which Facebook is change their ad platform for housing, employment, and credit ads. Um, also under the agreement are monitoring their activities over a three year period. And in addition, there are some outstanding concerns about some of their algorithmic features that they have agreed to study and confer with us about under this three year term and, and continue to evaluate some of these platform features that are, that are problematic. Happy to talk more about that, but I know we've got limited time here. And so I'll, I'll turn it back over there and, and, and uh, look forward to the rest of this discussion. Thanks. And yeah, we definitely have some questions later on that we'll dive deeper into, into that aspect of algorithm bias. Um, so next, I wanted to turn it to Hodan. So Hodan, you've written about how internet platforms could potentially use automated tools to try and tackle the growing spread of misinformation and disinformation online. But you've also warned that in some instances, these algorithms can generate unfavorable and biased results. Can you walk us through what some of the risks related to using these kinds of tools in a content moderation setting are? Yeah, thanks very much for having me. Um, I'll start by saying that um, although I'm based in DC, I'm actually from London. So Nicole, uh, you know, the IB program, uh, and which was overseen by the UK government, and then the subsequent um, A-level and GCSC kind of for all was obviously touched quite close to home for, for me. So I'm also very passionate about that. Uh, but yes, content moderation and algorithms and automated tools. Um, I think I'll start by saying, I think first, um, you know, given the scale of the issue, um, 
I think platforms, it's a necessity for them to be able to use these kind of automated tools in order to really deal with the deluge of data um, and kind of hoaxes and conspiracy theories that are coming up. It's just not really feasible for a group of humans to be able to pass through that much data. Um, and it's also very taxing. There's a lot of research that has shown and kind of stories that have come out about how taxing and difficult it is to have to kind of look through all of that and, and deal with such, you know, harmful um, kind of content. Um, but I think where the issue comes in with content moderation is in um, thinking that automated tools or algorithmic solutions, purely technical solutions are, are ones that can solve the issue alone, or that it's the kind of the sole responsibility of the platforms to be able to kind of figure this out. Um, for one, kind of research from the computer science uh, kind of community has shown that there are limits to these AI tools. So things like natural language processing, it's very developed, it's continuing to develop, it's very good at kind of recognizing patterns, um, but it's not a thinking being. It doesn't understand the kind of nuance on the small scale that humans can do. And so it can't kind of scale that nuance on a very large scale very well. Um, and it can't really be expected to. Um, I think ideally, policymakers would kind of want to hold responsible the people who are originating this content, but that's also very difficult to do. Um, but if kind of on the large scale, if you think about um, kind of state based foreign actors, if they're getting involved with um, elections, they should be held responsible and, and penalized. Um, if and on the small scale, I think there's been some research that came out of Cardiff University that said the majority of um, myths and disinformation is actually originating from traditional media and originating from um, governments. And so um, there needs to be some kind of liability on the kind of individual and, and, and groups that are originating this information. And at the same time, I think we need to invest in digital literacy tools and, and helping communities be able to understand and spot um, these, uh, you know, misinformation and, and how to deal with it. Um, so I think if we're able to hold the right people responsible, ensure that platforms have the kind of transparency uh, to, to understand what kind of decisions they're making in, in the algorithmic tools that they employ and um, kind of investing in our communities and investing in and providing them with the tools to deal with this, then that will be a kind of more comprehensive and actionable way to um, kind of deal with the very difficult task of, of um, mis- and disinformation. Awesome, thank you. Um, so the next sort of set of questions I wanted to jump into were really to explore what we mean when we talk about bias and frameworks for approaching bias. So the technology space, as you all know, brings together a number of different stakeholders from different professional backgrounds. And so the term bias can sort of take on many different definitions depending on one's field of view. And I think Dr. Turner Lee also already touched on what sort of her thinking around what this means, but wanted to open it up or, um, to the rest of the panel to see how each of you would define bias in the context of algorithmic decision making. Me first? Okay. Uh, sure. <laughs> uh, so I think I, I, I would kind of, it's kind of very quite, quite aligned with, with Nicole. I, I think I would describe kind of algorithmic bias as this tendency for an algorithm to produce disparate impacts um, among different groups. But I think what I would stress is that it's not only among, among different groups, but also within groups. So, um, you know, there are many different skin tones within um, every particular race. And so if you think about um, black people, there are light skinned, there's dark skin, there's shades all in between. How is an algorithm, uh, you know, affecting a light skinned black person versus a dark skinned black person? What if it's a dark skinned black person and they're a woman? What if they're a dark skinned black woman who's a Jew? You know, how, how are these different um, kind of intersections being dealt with? And so I think algorithmic bias is, is it, it needs to think about, um, you know, splitting it in different groups, but also how is it impacting within those groups? And is it better at, um, you know, working within groups in one race versus another race? Um, so that's, that's kind of how I think about it. If, can I actually uh, tag along to that? And I, I think I love what you're talking about. And it's actually a new way of thinking about this. I think when we look at things like facial recognition technology, right, this is a great case in point where the technology in it of itself is still technically inaccurate when it comes to the tracing of complexion hues. So the data suggests that uh, women of color who are in different shades, that's what I was actually talking about, right, will not be picked up by facial recognition technology. And if you are a woman, a black woman in particular, who changes their hair, so people who follow me know that I change my hair at the whim based on the mood I'm in, that will also not be picked up. 
the challenge there is, okay, should we be concerned that, you know, this bias is generating, you know, these differences in terms of face detection, or should we be concerned that as a result of its inaccuracy, that it has, for example, just a couple years ago, misidentified members of the Congressional Black Caucus as criminals based on the fact that they were misidentified in the technology? Should we be concerned that facial recognition is being used for protest surveillance that may pick up the wrong person? So I think it's such an interesting way to look at bias. I think we have technically, particularly when I deal with engineers, have looked at bias as more of a technical nuance, whereas it's not often understood that that technical difference, that techno, technical malalignment, actually may result in someone being over-criminalized or it may result in someone actually being treated differently based on not necessarily what people create in the lab, but how it's actually deployed within the real world. And I think that's where this whole conversation of understanding the, the gradations of bias, and particularly, just the last point, when you don't have diverse people working around you, you don't know this inside, um, inside the box sort of secrets as to what could happen if you actually deploy the technology outside of an engineering program or outside of a industry-based uh, computer lab or design engineering lab. And so I think those are really uh, important points that you brought up, right? Because that's sort of what I work on a lot oftentimes is like getting engineers to understand that these nuances are not actually integrated into their modeling and it has the potential to force disparate treatment of, of actors that may not necessarily realize that they're being discriminated against. I'll chime in on this question and um, forgive me if my internet uh, was just a little unstable, um, <clears throat> Nicole, for a part of your response, but um, I would just add um, to this um, with some recent learning that I have had in this space, I should say, uh, but in general, in the, in the fair housing world, using disparate impact analysis in bringing housing discrimination cases, we look at outcomes irrespective of accuracy. Um, and, and, and that outcome, as it has a different effect on uh, the basis of race or national origin or the different kinds of protections under the Fair Housing Act, then, then that, is, that is what we look at in, in, in deriving statistics to understand um, liability associated with this policy that, that has this outcome. And in the computer science world, uh, you know, I've come to know that, you know, um, there are these two really important kind of different um, concepts that deal with both kind of outcome and accuracy. And, 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 uh, and, and th that distinction is something that I think is actually really important in regards to what HUD has just recently done with the final uh, disparate impact rule that it is just finalized and will be issued on the federal register really any day now. But the two concepts here in the computer uh, science sort of world speak are, you know, bias as one concept, which is about uh, uh, accuracy and, uh, and does the model predict accurately. Um, and not being biased means that it's not equally predictive. Um, and then the, there's a second concept, which is lack of statistical parity, which is at the end of the day, what are the outcomes? And I think what we uh, are, are concerned with from a fair housing perspective is uh, not the bias in the com computer science sense necessarily, although that has an impact on the model significantly and is, is, is of great concern you know, um, to, to, to ensuring viable models, but the lack of statistical parity. And um, what HUD has done in this final rule that has just issued, um, is uh, is it essentially has said that um, you know if a, if a uh, a model is predictive, then it doesn't matter if it has a discriminatory outcome, and uh, that's really problematic from a civil rights perspective for the ability to apply this important legal standard, and uh, and and that kind of a, a a proposed policy you know needs to be challenged. But I'll I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, and so the next question I want to talk about, when we think about improving algorithmic systems and addressing issues of bias, um, a number of stakeholders have pushed for greater fairness, accountability, and transparency 
um, while others sort of opt for frameworks that focus on explainability and trustworthiness. Um, what do these terms mean to all of you? And um, are there specific frameworks that you would lift up more than others or, um, and, and why, I guess? Um, any takers? I, I guess I'm the new jumper in pasta. Uh, I think I would, I would, um, I think fairness or algorithmic fairness, how I would, how I would think about it is kind of being understood as the absence of unwanted discrimination. And I think something that I've kind of recently been thinking about is there are instances in which you do want um, kind of, or it might be beneficial to have some kinds of algorithmic bias. So if you think about um, aid, uh, the distribution of aid, um, you know, I know that the DOD's Joint AI Center, you know, kind of when it first kind of started up, it was doing a lot of work around how can we put AI, system, put AI systems to work in, in distributing aid. And the UN and, and, and uh, kind of international bodies have shown that a lot of work has shown that, um, you know, in some countries, in some areas where women are kind of struggle with um, political participation and financial participation and, and are oppressed in many ways, um, providing aid to women in those countries as opposed to men and kind of having this bias towards having extra aid for women um, is, is beneficial across communities. It can help the communities grow uh, better, um, can recover from shocks better. Um, and so if you had an algorithmic bias towards women in aid distribution, that actually might be something that you want overall. So kind of touching on what Morgan said is coming away from this kind of um, just thinking about bias in, in the context of a particular algorithm, but thinking about how it impacts society as a whole and kind of taking a step back and taking a more holistic view to make sure that you're having fairness um, overall. Uh, that's kind of what I've been thinking about in terms of algorithmic fairness. And, and then with um, kind of explainability, there's this always this kind of distinction between um, interpretability and explainability. So if you think about, let's say I went to the doctor and um, you know, they said, based on your age group, you know, the fact that you're 18, I'm not 18, but let's just say, uh, the fact that you're of a certain gender and that you're from a certain ethnic group, um, you know, this AI system predicts that you are going to have certain heart problems at the age of um, 50. Uh, and so the interpretability is it's telling me based on these factors, that's why this AI system had this. But the explainability is, you need to exercise three times a week, you know, having this kind of value that I can extract from it. But there are so many different stakeholders that might have um, benefits and values from having explainability. So whilst I need to know that I need to um, exercise three times a week for my doctor, it might be you need to prescribe her these medicines. For researchers, it might be why is, uh, you know, uh, a woman of that age in that ethnic group um, you know, having higher predictions, you researchers, you need to look into these sorts of things. So having multiple different types of interpretability, um, uh, rather different types of explainability is, is something that I think um, provides a lot of value and should be focused on. Um, so that's, that's what those kind of many words mean to me. Just to uh, build off of that, um, you know, some attempts to debias to to make a, a model more um, accurately predictive produce greater disparate impact. And in the housing market, um, a, a, a great area of of long concern and work um, in considering various discriminatory outcomes is in regards to to credit modeling. Um, to, to home, home, home mortgage uh, credit underwriting models. And uh, we look to see, um, you know, whether credit models um, predict, you know, differently for different groups, and then we look at the outcomes. And in instances when you de-bias, you can create, again, more disparate impact. For example, um, you know, you could look at as a factor in your underwriting how many subprime inquiries an applicant has made before, or which is to say how many, you know, inquiries into a subprime lending product um, or, uh, or, um, or a fringe market product an applicant has made. Um, you know, that might be equally predictive between white applicants and black applicants, but the application of that factor might have a tremendous disparate impact. And so under a, a traditional disparate impact liability model, 
you'd have to look for a less discriminatory alternative, some other factor that may be similarly predictive, but without that disparate impact. And again, what HUD has done in their recent proposed rule is to simply say, you know, if it involves some sort of policy that's based on a predictive um, analysis, if it is, if it is de-biased, if it is accurate, then it is free of disparate impact liability, which is um, complete um, exception uh, that will really undermine the ability to challenge some of these algorithmic models moving forward. And I would add on uh, what my colleagues have said. I mean, there's a couple of problems with this. One, um, until, and this is something that some people have heard me uh, talk about and something I'm writing on as we do this work at Brookings, you know, until we actually explicitly apply the civil rights laws to algorithmic uh, decision making, we will always have this conversation because fairness is an elusive concept. What Fairness means to one group of people could mean a trade-off to another group of people. So I commonly have this conversation on criminal justice algorithms, which is around, well, you know, the, fair, the, the types of variables that we're using for criminal justice algorithms actually uh, decreases the number of Black people who are, are held or detained for a crime. And I always say to them, yeah, it may, uh, you know, decrease that amount by 1%, but African Americans are over-criminalized already. So there's still flaws in the general system that the algorithm may correct for, but it cannot solve or remedy in a way that actually reduces the type of stereotypical amplification that we're actually seeing. So with that, until we actually apply these civil rights laws to these algorithmic models, I think to Morgan's point, and I'm just kind of mad right now about HUD, you really wouldn't see this sort of loosely, loosely constructed model that the prediction may be good, suggesting that poor people are poor, and that's why they should see certain housing ads. That's ultimately ridiculous, right? At the end of the day, if an advertiser is not sharing ads in an equitable way, they are violating the Fair Housing Act, period, right? And that's where we saw the Facebook example their ability to allow housing uh, marketers to check off boxes was not in accordance with the law. And so the more that we actually talk around the issue, as opposed to saying that there is certain compliance that developers have to follow when it comes to fair housing, fair credit, equal employment, healthcare, et cetera, then we're gonna have this conversation over and over again. And I'm gonna tell you the second reason why. And I'm gonna go back to what I said earlier. When we don't have diversity and the developers and the designers or the licensors of these models, they're gonna miss it. And they are going to create models that in their mind, based on their values, norms, and assumptions that goes into the modeling are pretty accurate. They're not gonna be accurate. That's why you just not only need people of different demographic um, categories, but you also need sociologists. You also need ethicists. You need privacy professionals. You need folks that are not scientists sitting at the table. You know, in my work, I've been trying to push for interdisciplinary conversation on this. This area is way too important. This is not like email. It's not like anything that we've seen before. The determinations that come out of these models where people cannot sit side by side and say, hey, I just saw an ad for a firm, you know, lay, layaway programs, and I didn't, <laughs> which is why the Apple card instant was so interesting to me, because two people applied at the same time. So until we actually see these measurements, and I love what Morgan is actually talking about because in my work, I've been trying to figure out what's the best way for companies in particular and uh, developers and academies to sort of measure against disparate impact. In addition to the disparate impact model, it's also important to sort of think about, you know, is this proxy replicating race? <laughs> you know, is this um, addition of blinding the algorithm, really blinding the algorithm, if it can pick up on other uh, uh, variables that the person has also engaged in online? And so again, I think until we have some solid definition around this uh, internet of, of, of machine learning algorithms is not exempted from following the law. Let's just start there. We need algorithms that are lawful. Once we realize that and I love what's been brought up about, you know, there's always going to be some level of discrimination. But once we realize that this is lawful, but it also may generate some other activity based on the inferences, then I think it's up to us to develop the right type of models, including the review of the training data, to have better practices. Just to say one last thing on this, because you can see I work on this all the time. Um, I've been working on this model called an algorithmic energy star rating. 
And it doesn't have anything to do at this point with enforcement. Because some people say, Nicole, you can't do that. That's just another enforcement on innovation. It's really about process. It's about what is a company, a developer, a licensor of algorithms doing up front to actually generate some of the best practices when it comes to debiasing algorithms. And when there are determinations where you may not have good training data, are you making that aware uh, to your consumers? So for example, you can't see my face because I changed my hair. Put a little label and tell me that you can't see my face because I changed my hair or because I'm black, period, right? But then there's also part of this energy star rating. What is it that we're missing? Is the data sufficient enough to actually make the determination? Is it underrepresented? Is it overrepresented? And then finally, what do consumers say about this? Where's the feedback loop for any of us that are on this meeting event to be able to tell an algorithm, no, that's not me. That was actually my cousin who used my computer or my mobile phone. Or I might have did this at one period of time, but I don't want to keep getting served back ads that are 39% you know, interest rate or 29% interest rate. Uh, until we actually develop some type of process that I think helps us to steer clear to much more affordable algorithms that may impress upon the, the best capacity or the best process for fairness, I think we're going to keep having this conversation, honestly. Um, I've had it for over two years now, and it seems like we're talking about it more, but we're still sort of not clear on what we expect from developers to ensure non-discriminatory outcomes. Definitely. And that actually leads perfectly into my next question, which was um, when we think about, you know, trying to reduce the instances of harmful outcomes and promote greater fairness and accountability in these systems, um, there are a number of approaches. Nicole mentioned some of them, and there's also ones like algorithmic audits and impact assessments that have come up. Um, so I wanted to know a sort of um, what you all think of these different approaches, who you think they should be targeted towards and who are best equipped to conduct these kinds of assessments. And I first wanted to actually pass it to Hodan because I know that the Center for Data Innovation has released a framework for algorithmic accountability. Um, so I'd love to hear more about how that fits into the conversation. Yeah, thank you. So um, yeah, so the Center for Data Innovation released a report back in 2018. Um, and I know that we actually had a panel that Nicole was on when we did release that report. Um, and it's really a framework for um, regulators to kind of address specific harms um, that algorithms cause in particular um, kind of application areas. So um, this framework kind of says that algorithm, algorithmic systems should have a variety of controls, both procedural and technical, to ensure that the operator of the um, AI system is able to do two things. One, um, ensure that the um, system is operating in a way that aligns with the intentions of the uh, operator. And number two, that they can identify kind of harms that come from it. So if we think about the um, education example that Nicole was talking about earlier, um, Ofqual, who is the uh, regulating body that kind of developed and, and uh, deployed this algorithm. Uh, if obviously it had disastrous results, if we want to kind of hold someone accountable, um, they were the ones who uh, are using it. It's kind of context specific. Um, they should be held accountable, but how can we hold them accountable? One, how can we um, evidence, can they evidence that their AI system was working in the unbiased way that they intended it to? Can they evidence that they have transparency? Can they evidence that they have explainability? Um, do they have um, kind of confidence measures? If they can't show those things, then they should be penalized. Second, can they show that, um, that they can identify harms that come from this AI system? When it happened with the IB program, did they do impact assessments? Did they do error analysis? If they had, it might be that they, it wouldn't have been applied to GCSE and A-levels and that just kind of blew this up even more. Um, and I think um, there is this kind of focus in the framework on the operator. Um, given that kind of algorithms are context specific but you know as my colleagues have said um there is a, a, there is that doesn't mean there's no onus on the developer that, to have uh, to make sure that you know there is diversity among the people who are kind of creating and um, developing these algorithms because if you have a very narrow set of people who are um you know all come from the same background and kind of have the same educational experiences you are going to have a narrow algorithm narrow algorithms and narrow ai systems And I would I would add to uh, the the response here um, to suggest that um, 
really uh, the the transparency and accountability here should be on on all uh, the, the private actors in the market. And there is an outstanding issue here about the interplay between civil rights statutes and the Fair Housing Act that we enforce and the Communications Decency Act and immunity that that provides sort of platforms posting content. And that has been raised as a, it was raised as a defense by Facebook in our litigation in at the motion to, to dismiss stage, in which at the time notably led by uh, US attorneys in the Southern District of New York, the, the Department of Justice filed an amicus brief asserting that the Fair Housing Act should apply here um, and, and, and that C CDA immunity should not supersede that civil rights liability. Um, the, the case was settled before a decision in that case, but the, uh, the, that motion to dismiss litigation, but there is other outstanding litigation, uh, motion to dismiss litigation um, that has been argued and a, a decision is pending on this legal question and it will have broad ramifications for really the uh, application of liability to s some of these private online operators. And so I wanted to flag that as one outstanding issue that um, ultimately may require sort of legislative fixes to clarify that these civil rights statutes should apply online. Um, as I think uh, the current case is uh, being litigated before fairly um, conservative judge on these issues. Um, uh, and then the, the, the other thing I would say about sort of, you know, um, you know, who, who, who should be kind of um, on the hook here? Well, uh, 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 is, um, you know, federal regulators, I think, really need to, to play a more prominent role moving forward. Um, this is federal banking regulators, the CFPB, um, and, and, you know, even, you know, agencies, civil rights agencies, Department of Justice and HUD and the work that they, 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 they can and, and should do in this space. And, um, and, and I would just underscore that, you know, there's technical limitations that they have, but those are solvable problems if you're committed to solving them. And uh, you need to, we need to ensure that federal regulators are staffed and, and have the capacity to properly monitor and, 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 and ensure um, that, that these civil rights issues are, 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 uh, are regulated in this space. Yeah, and I would add that I think um, we need as many tools in the toolkit as possible. So I think, you know, the thing that I think regulators and policymakers sort of get hung up on is their inability to understand what's in the black box and their inability to understand the causal relationship or the correlate between these variables. I would actually argue that policymakers should be more concerned with the outputs and the outcomes. And so I think any type of movement towards impact assessments that sort of work backwards versus forward in terms of how do we get to this rejection of a loan decision? How do we get to this profiling or the lack of delivery of ads for um, diverse populations? Um, or why does this look like this proxy actually generates some type of disparate impact? might be more helpful for policymakers who aren't data scientists like myself or computer engineers. So anything we can put in the toolbox, I'm all for it. Whether it be an impact statement, explainability statement, a racial bias statement, I'm there. But I do like what Morgan said in terms of the role of regulators, though. I think there will be spaces, however, where we need industry or designers to developers to work with government. FinTech was a great example of that, where they worked together under regulatory sandboxes to ensure that they were able to debias some of the models early on. We should see some of that, I think, in those cases that we care about. Again, employment, education, healthcare, financial services, and housing. The extent to which we could actually get these regulatory sandboxes to be much more organic and much more active, I think will help sort of reduce consumer harm in the long run. And I also think it's important in terms of a government's role is to provide more inclusive data sets. So where government could also be helpful is that we know that the National Science Foundation or Congress, Congressional Appropriations are not necessarily going into funding data sets that could be much more representative of the problems that we're trying to solve or the uh, models that we're trying to develop. So I love you know, what everybody has said, but I also think that there's this push next what role do we want regulators to play? And I don't think it's in the front end, but then two, where can Congress actually help create a much more healthy ecosystem that sort of saves off the types of harms that we're discussing today? I wanted to 
I wanted to pick up on Nicole's uh, point about it being uh, up to us to develop the right types of models. And just, just note that, you know, the National Fair Housing Alliance uh, takes this to heart and um, we haven't yet sort of announced sort of some of our plans, but there are efforts to develop a tech equity um, effort um, and to um, and specifically develop some programmatic solutions to this that would um, help to uh, develop and uplift some of these best practices in a kind of open source toolbox way in regards to the to the credit underwriting space in particular. If, if I could add one, one more thing on this, uh, I would just say that um, I think, you know, one other thing that 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 I, I think about is that um, a lot of times if we think about the Hispanic community say um, autism is you know very underdiagnosed and it's because we don't have enough data on that particular uh, community we don't have enough um, information on groups within um, minority communities and, and sometimes it's not even just groups within groups it can be entire communities if you think about the trans community um, that it wasn't until 2016 that they were really kind of included and so I think moving forward data availability data quality and um, kind of uh, bringing that up is going to be vital because no matter if you get the triangle of you know policymakers developers and deployers and you know community together if you don't have um, you know enough data or, or good quality data that's that's uh, fair across the board it's just it's not going to work yeah if i could i love what you said on because that speaks to i think what we have seen in the tech industry which is break it now and apologize later and that challenge with not having enough data or insufficient insufficient data has actually been so interesting because you know as a researcher if i want to study a community i have to get irb compliance or some kind of human subjects uh, statement where i will come with a certain care around their data not to bring up privacy in this conversation but all of these things intersect in many respects because at the end of the day the quality of your data particularly in the tech industry is not necessarily an indicator of whether you are going to do right or you're going to do wrong and so i think going forward we need to have these types of conversations and i was on a panel one day and one of the folks said which i stuck with me in this work it's not in this new industry in a digital economy it's not necessarily up for consumers to trust, uh, for consumers to sort of have the say on what, what's happening around them because you know we're just out of control when it comes to technology. But there are no longer brick and mortar stores where you could actually have that one-on-one -on -one customer service relationship. So it's really up to these tech companies to maintain the stewardship of folks like us. And why we're talking about this more and more today is any company that pillages your data or creates discriminatory outcomes are landing up on the front page of the newspaper because of that. And I think, you know, going forward, we shouldn't have to force companies to do the right thing. If anything, we should look at everything that we talked about as a bridge towards actually being better and creating higher performing algorithms that will actually get to what they are intended for and not necessarily pick up all the junk, right, that we're speaking to right now. Awesome. Um, so I wanted to turn it over to audience questions right now for the time that we have left. We have a couple that have come in. Um, the first one is uh, NIST is currently undertaking the hard task of helping create guidance for what constitutes trustworthy AI based on multi-stakeholder feedback. Could you comment on these efforts? And sure. I can for a minute because I actually did two of their panels <laughs> as part of leading up to this conversation. So again, I think this is doing a great thing. I'm actually applauding them as an agency who doesn't have necessarily the rulemaking authority, uh, who are scientists, to actually delve into the space of how they make uh, fairer algorithms. With that being said, they also realize they need help. Like a, you know, a sociologist sitting before NIST is a huge accomplishment, uh, given the fact that my colleagues on both panels were scientists. So to the person's comment, I think they're taking this very seriously because they are the agency responsible for creating the standards that actually uh, implement and roll out the algorithms that we see, particularly uh, just a couple of months ago or last year, they put out standards around facial recognition technology in terms of validation and verification. So yes, they are actually engaging that process and we at our, our Brookings and all honesty are hoping to learn more from them as we conduct our own research project around facial recognition technology and law enforcement. And so again, I think where they're headed is, is right on. 
but they happen to be one of the agencies that sort of Morgan talked about that doesn't necessarily make rulemaking <laughs> um, about this. So the extent to which there'll be some scientific um, verification of what we're talking about today is excellent, but we need entities that actually can develop an alignment with those civil rights statutes. Great, uh, Hodan or Morgan, do either of you want to take a shot? If not, we can move on to the next one. Okay, um, so uh, one of our um, attendees commented that she's really worried about leaving it up to tech companies and someone asked a question, Chris asked a question about how can online platforms and other companies step up to provide greater transparency and accountability around their use of these algorithms and any subsequent discriminatory results. Um, I know we talked a little bit about, um, Nicole, you mentioned, um, you know, disclosing any flaws. Are there any other approaches? Yeah, I mean, I'll just say this, because that comment came after I mentioned something about tech companies actually also stepping up. I think to that person's question, you're right, you cannot leave it in the tech companies uh, complete belly whip to do this, but they have to play a role because in the, in the um, uh, possible opportunity to sort of be more transparent about their product, they're actually then creating a security for us as consumers, which is why I've been working on this Energy Star rating. I kind of align that Energy Star rating, for example, to what happened with the big yellow sticker in the uh, uh, appliance stores, where you go in there with some assurance that what you're purchasing when you get a dishwasher or a dryer has the specs from the EPA and the FTC, by the way, of how much electricity, how much water, how durable the plastic is. I think tech companies have a responsibility not just to be transparent about the purpose of their algorithm, but they need to be transparent around its flaws and deficiencies. If we don't, in this unregulated space, sort of not put anything on their laps, then I think we run the risk of not actually collecting what companies that are actually knocking this out the ballpark, like Microsoft and others who do secondary tertiary testing, uh, some companies in terms of financial services that I've interviewed that look at what Morgan is talking about, proxies that may mirror Fair Lending uh, Act uh, discriminations. You need a combination of all three, which is also why I think you need civil society in there as well. Because again, without the combination of these three, uh, you know, we're not necessarily going into a space without public policymakers, industry, as well as civil society to pay attention to those use cases. So I'll, I'll answer just that first part and leave it up to my peers to answer the second part. Well, one comment off of that and, and the interplay between them, you know, one forum for that interplay is liability and civil rights liability and the ability for, you know, private parties or impacted individuals to sue some of these platforms. And that's really why this CDA, Communications Decency Act, immunity coverage question, which is a legal question in, in regards to um, application of this immunity to these platforms and, the, and, and, their, and their civil rights obligations under federal civil rights law um, is, is such an important question. It's pending now again in the courts and it ultimately may be something that we need to find legislative solutions to help clarify. Um, because without that liability, uh, then there's uh, less of an opportunity for an engagement among some of those parties and less of an interest that the platforms may have. Um, so would, would add that piece um, and would, would add a, just one other piece, which is just, um, you know, uh, it, it, you know, it can't, it, 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 in terms of transparency, you know, a part of it is, is sort of these, these uh, entities you know, disclosing this information, a part of them, a part of it is just these entities reviewing their own models themselves. Um, and, uh, and so, and having some sort of basis of review with which to be transparent about as a baseline. And uh, there was a recent uh, Wall Street Journal article that suggested that for a period of time in 2019, uh, Facebook actually had barred its employees from studying disparate impact uh, racial impacts specifically associated with its platform without sort of this special permission from the most senior executives. Um, and and it's, it's worth noting that I guess in, also covered in this recent Wall Street Journal article that they have now created this inclusivity product team that will specifically study um, the issues um, that, that are, you know, a, a, of, of the, the potential um, um, tech equity um, bias outcomes 
um, type of questions. Um, so, you know, uh, I think a part of it is just these companies' willingness to, to take a look at some of these issues um, is, is, is still something that we're fighting over. And, uh, and, and we need to see more leadership from these companies. Um, Spandy, if I could actually just respond real quickly to Morgan's piece, because I, I, you just triggered something I do would love to just make sure we keep talking about. The challenge, though, too, Morgan, when you start looking at the Commun Communications Decency Act is we still are trying to regulate new companies against old platforms or old paradigms. And so I think going forward, what's interesting is I do this work on algorithmic um, uh, search ranking and the power of algorithms and you know for another conversation we should talk about this we're really delving into a new space right this new space of algorithmic amplification that goes beyond the cases that we spoke about today but it goes into election integrity and it goes into uh, the the uh, emergence and submergence of, of hate speech etc I think going forward we really need to start looking at the accountability of these systems in ways that force us to have some conversation around what you're talking about. And so again, I just put out there, I'm not sure as a person who's been doing telecom policy and policy related to technology for a long time, if we need to keep fitting you know, these square pegs into round holes and potentially to your point, come out with a legislative solution that really attends itself to what these new models are creating. Great, and uh, Hodan, do you wanna uh, wrap it up for us? I think, I think they got it. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, thank you everyone for joining us today. We're now at the hour, so unfortunately that's all the time we have. Um, please keep your eyes out for the next event as part of this event series on the 24th, which is focused on racial and gender biases in facial recognition systems. And thank you all for joining us and thank you so much to all of our great speakers for a really interesting panel. Have a good day. <laughs>